So look, what I've got is six tips, uh, six ideas to share this morning, just so that you can, um, I guess, reflect on these as you plan procurements, plan sourcing events. And my tips particularly relate to to the, the part of the process where where there's solicitation, where 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 offers are are sought and and um, decisions, sourcing outcomes made. Okay, let's uh, let's get going. So, so the way I've structured this is in three parts, really. And so I'll talk uh, about a couple of tips in the, the, the bit, as you can see on the screen there, I call before. So, so inside of this business development uh, cycle, this life cycle, uh, the, the opportunity assessing and the capture phase, as it's, uh, as it's uh, understood in, in uh, the, the art and science of work winning. So things that, that suppliers do or want to do before we get to uh, the time where, where proposals uh, are produced, which is the, the during uh, section that I've identified here. Then afterwards, so once, so once something's been submitted, the things that can happen between there and, and a deal being done, and then on delivery happening after that. So that's the structure. Uh, so I've got two tips in each one, just uh, to keep it all nice and balanced. Before I move on, I just want to share, I guess, a, a, a sort of a fundamental insight. And I'm not sure that everybody gets this, but on on the you know, good selling organisations recognise that, that, that their fundamental motivator is to be trusted. And generally speaking, and, and I, I'll reflect on my own procurement career, we will pick organisations, we will we will select, yes, in terms of value for money and and uh, and the like, but. It's fundamentally a process around trust building, and and uh, the the idea of trust, and, and we've sort of borrowed from uh, from a um, Harvard Business uh, Review article published by Frey and um, Morris around this idea of a trust triangle, and trust has these elements of empathy, logic, and authenticity. And empathy principally means that 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 the organisation kind of gets you. Um, what they offer you makes sense, which is logical and they're authentic or believable. So, so in, a, in, a, in a selling environment, how does, how, and especially in a tendering environment, how does an organisation get to show you enough so that you trust them? And, and it's a really fundamental principle, which I'll, which I'll guess you'll see carrying into the six tips. Okay, I better get going, otherwise uh, Jonathan's going to cut me off. So let's get into those before... Uh, those those couple of tips beforehand now. Now, the first one of these tips, so tip number one, is a, a very fundamental principle, which is they just may not be into you. So, or other words, uh, and you might not be into them either. So this, this, this is such an important upfront um, activity suite that I think a lot of procurement people fail to recognise. And that is... Selling organisations are trying to work out whether you, uh, the buyer, are a customer of choice. They, they need to know whether they should be investing their business development and capture effort into you. And sometimes they just might not be a fit. And it, it is, it's not great establishing that at the time of tender. In fact, it, it, it usually results in no bids, it results in poor submissions, it results in all sorts of waste in that part of the process. So, so buyers, and, and I know you know this, re really need to create enough opportunity for the connections to be made and the fit to be established before we get to tendering. And I've just got a little, a little, a little flow chart here, which comes out of the, uh, the, the profession for proposal people called the Association of Proposal Management Professionals say that three times quickly and it's it talks about a decision tree which is what smart buying or selling organizations will run through um, a series of questions um, that, that then frame how they decide to qualify or not the opportunity and whether they will in fact or should in fact bid so you'll get a copy of these slides later but, but you can see the questions around is the opportunity real do we, as in the selling organisation, want it? Um, and more importantly, if we do, can we win it? And, and, and the centricity of understanding you and your issues is paramount. And if they can't, because you won't talk to them, um, um, it often will lead to a no bid for an organisation that you perhaps really did want in your, in your procurement. 
So now the second tip is, is a series of numbers really. And, and I think a lot of people, you know, maybe you get this intuitively, but, but not, not a lot of people I think really reflect on it, especially um, in my experience around the consequences in terms of, in terms of scale and effort um, in, in, in tendering as it's perceived by sellers. So the first of those tips we, um, here are, are, is the half to two and a half. And that's what we call the investment ratio. So that's, that's generally how much the marketplace sees the cost of tendering. A half to two and a half percent of the total deal value is what an organisation would typically expect to spend to win it. Now it skews depending on scale and sometimes you can take this in an aggregate sort of sense. So it's not necessarily deal by deal by deal, but as a general, a general guide, it's pretty, it's pretty important. So if, if you've got a fairly low value procurement and an extraordinarily onerous sort of process that supports it, it may miss the, the investment ratio. And, and an organisation might decide not to bid because it's just going to be too expensive to. And, and, and the expense is, is an aggregation of how they value their own time as well as any external support that they might get. The next one, 25 to 75, is a really interesting one. And this is the degree of reusability of content in tendering. So for an organisation that's bidding into a known market into, with, a, with a, a, a typical service, they might have up to three quarters of the boilerplate, as it's, as it's known in our, 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 our industry, a sort of, sort of content available. So perhaps not a real lot of customising of the tendering content. But on the other hand, if it's new, a bit different, um, there's a bit involved, most of the invitation response could be new draft. And, and so, and, and it takes a lot of time to write well. And I think what happens often is that people sort of underestimate how much time it actually takes, which is points to the percentages there, to, to actually do good quality tendering. So it is not a case that organisations sit around with boilerplate content, they just cut and paste and slap it into a into a tender and off it goes. Well, if if that's your experience, it's because it's been set up so that the organisations can't do it the right way. The last number is uh, um, range of sixty six to seventy is an acknowledged and an anecdotal, but also with some research behind it, a percentage of how likely it is that an incumbent, a good performing incumbent, will will re win a procurement. So, so the, 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 um, the, the recompete success rate is quite high for liked incumbents. So, so if you don't want your incumbent um, uh, to just automatically be the odds on favourite, then what are you going to do about it? Because generally speaking, that's what happens. And smart selling organisations know that and they make decisions around sourcing as a result of that. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the during part. So, so the couple of tips while the tender's live, if you like. Um, the first of these, um, so it's tip number three, is, is this idea, and it's around procurement technology, which is this, this and, and I know it's tech, and I know transformation, and I understand uh, the environment we're in, but, but it, it all, more often than not, the outworking of this in a tendering context when the sellers are looking at it is that it feels like it's a process of homogenizing. They fail to be able to really be able to demonstrate difference and value, which is a really interesting point because, because the market wants to demonstrate value to you. They don't want you to have to work it out. And, and I think sometimes our environment, um, as we set up to try to drive efficiencies, has this effect of, of homogenizing um, the differences, if you like, out of organizations now, and, and out of their offers. And, and I, I have to say that, that some of the platforms that I've helped organisations bid into are awful. They really are quite soul destroying. And, and, and I would encourage you to talk to the marketplace about their experiences inside of the, the, the sourcing environment and, and ways that we can actually try to let them show you more value rather than feel like they're a cog in a kind of a big machine. The fourth tip, um, which I know, uh, I know, um, you know, if you've been around procurement for a while, it's one of these wonderful questions. Do I ask or not ask? If I've got a query or a clarification request during a during a during a, a tender 
uh, open period. Do I do I ask a question or not? And and, and so so the reality is that there's there's two choices. Well, three really. Um, the first choice is I'll I'll seek to clarify. And by and large, we would strongly recommend organisations if they don't know something to ask a question uh, and and sort of get an answer. But a lot of organisations don't want to do that because they're worrying about it. Um, they worry about their, that, their, 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 that they'll actually have their, their good ideas shared with everybody inside of a, a process that works like that. So what they'll do then is assume. So you can clarify or you can assume or you can just ignore it. Now, if they assume, so they make an assumption um, um, because they don't want to make a clarification question, how is the procurement allowing them to make an assumption except inside of a, a clarification like or right, some sort of non-conformance register because because they, they they might need to be able to qualify their response now you don't want them to do that you want them to clarify but if they don't want to clarify how are you supporting the other the, the alternative it's it's a it's a really interesting question i do encourage procurement people have a little think about how how you can support that inside of procurement it'll be very much valued so, and, and now the, those first four tips, the, 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 the sort of the punchline through there, and I, I was alluding to it earlier, is that, is that, is that it, 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 all these things, if we don't do them well, it, it leads to what I call incumbentitis. It actually tends to reinforce, especially in a recompete, that, that the natural winner is the organisation that's doing the work already. Now, and I think we often do this without recognising it. So I actually think, the 66 to 70 percent is actually a function of how we set up our processes a lot of the time not necessarily it's the result that we particularly want okay i've got two more to go and i think i'm going okay time wise jd but so two more tips in the after part of of um tendering so the the the, the, the submission's been made the, the the you know the adjudication evaluations happening um so the the fifth tip so that the idea of being able to have some face-to-face -face is incredibly important. And so that, that whole idea of being able to talk um, some sort of pitch or if it's a presentation or if it's a clarification or if it's an offer definition, if you're in defence or whatever the case may be, is really important. Now, I, I actually don't mind that this happens earlier and certainly more agile type of procurement environment where this tends to happen earlier, I think is terrific. But, but it's, it's very much valued again organizations will be more interested if there's an opportunity through a down select or a short listing to be able to to talk and present and kind of kind of build some of that rapport which helps drive ultimately authenticity and then trust the sixth uh, tip which we all know about and i'm just going to reinforce it again is is the market values enormously feedback on on their submission whether it was successful or not and and I, I, I'm sorry to say that even after all these years, at, um, a lot of procurement organisations do a really bad job at this. Uh, they either take way too long to get back to the market, the, 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 the information that, that's imparted is generic and useless. And so I know there's rules, put, there's issues around probity about what you can say and not say, and I understand it can be a little bit, a little bit of a heightened tension environment, but but uh, is such an important part of tendering um, that, that businesses understand what they've done well and not so that they can get better for next time.